Good evening. I'm John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is April 23rd, 2001. And this evening we are pleased to have with us Arnold Pinsley. Arnold, how are you tonight? I'm sitting up and taking nourishment, I hope. <laughs> That's, we're off to a good start. <laughs> May I ask you how old you are? I'm 61. 61. And your current address? Is here in Natick. And your current marital status? I am married. Do you have children? I have a, I have a son and I have two stepdaughters. And any grandchildren? Yes, we have two grandchildren. Really? Mm -hmm. That's very good. Yeah. Where were you born, Arnold? I was born in Cambridge. And raised? Raised in Cambridge and lived there until I graduated from Cambridge Latin. And then I went off to school at the University of Pennsylvania and stayed there until 1962 when I joined the United States Army Reserves. What did you study at the University of Pennsylvania? Transportation and Public Utility Economics. Can you tell us what that entails? All right. Uh, basically, they were um, the course is uh, directed at preparing someone to manage, say, a trucking company, maybe a, a segment of an air uh, of an airline company, or a railroad. My particular interest was in public transportation, which made me stand out a bit. But uh, the background was a good one, nonetheless. Then I went on to get a master's degree in regional science. Regional science. I'm regional, afraid you're going okay. to explain science, that one too. Regional science takes the position that um, geographic boundaries and political boundaries are impediments to looking at a statistical area, say a standard metropolitan statistical unit, and it uh, creates a statistical unit or an a socioeconomic unit if we can that's probably a better term and deals with interdependencies within that unit and between that unit and other similar units so living in this area we refer to as uh, west of boston that's right uh, metro west metro west is a small smsa that's really that's right. cut out for you then isn't it right. that's where you're dealing with that's exactly okay, right okay that's very good can you tell us about your family background? What did your dad do? My dad was a manufacturer's rep in the hotel and restaurant equipment supply. And um, he sold china and glassware and um, oh, cleaning tables and um, not cleaning tables, steam tables, excuse me, and um, dishwashers and things of this nature for more than 50 years. And what Here in New England. In New, in New England was his right. territory. Right, New England was his territory. And how about your mom? My mom was a ceramicist, and she had a studio on Newbury Street until her death. And that studio was roughly in the place where the Pucker Fry Gallery is today, at 175 Newbury Street. I think the address of her studio in those days was 177, something like that, if memory serves me correctly. That's a very auspicious uh, address in Boston. It, it, is, it certainly is today. A Tony uh, neighborhood right. there. It certainly is today. Um, she was interested in teaching people how to create ceramics, and she realized that there was money in that. Um, she was also interested in marketing some of some of her work some of her students work and this was the this was the arena for that activity i i don't see in what they did how you wound up at the university of pennsylvania she was a graduate of the university of pennsylvania was she okay. yes she was she was okay. a um, she was a bachelor's degree in the school. She had a bachelor's degree in the school of ed, and then she got a master's degree in the same school. 
She had originally wanted to go to the Wharton School, but women weren't permitted entry into the Wharton School in 1928. So she went to the School of Ed, as she was told to do, and she took all of her electives in the Wharton School. Came out of the Wharton School, or not the Wharton School, came out of the, the School of Ed in 1932 and tried to open a bookstore on the LaSalle Railroad Station in Chicago. Well, of course, nobody was buying books in those days. They might buy a newspaper so that they could sleep under it. And her bookstore lasted about, I think it lasted six months, nine months at the most. And um, she took a job teaching in high school in Cincinnati thereafter. She absolutely hated it, but uh, <laughs> it paid some bills. And that's where she met my dad. And, yeah, and in those days that was extremely important. Right. Um, how about your high school? Was that in uh, Cambridge or? Yes, yeah. I went to Cambridge Latin. Okay. And um, took the college prep course. And what year did you get out of high school? 56. 56. Mm -hmm. What was doing in the United States in 56? People speak of the 50s as the apathetic generation. But I remember campus as being very, very active then. These, this was the period of time when all of the organizations that flank, sprang into full activity in the early 60s were formed on college campuses all over the country. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was formed then. Students for Democratic Society was forming then. Uh, the Council on Racial Equality was forming then. The um, um, NAACP was becoming very active on college campuses all over the country. We sat in at a Horn and Hardit's lunchroom on campus in 19, let's see, the spring of 1958. We sat in there. We also sat in at a Woolworth's luncheon in 1958. So the, these were um, years of great social activity on campuses. And you were a social activist yourself, not yes, a bystander. Uh, yeah. That is a, a, a passive and this was, this was a these were activities that, infu that infused all of campus life. I mean, uh, um, the Interfraternity Council was fully involved in all of these activities. Well, it, it, in 1956, what is that in relation to the Korean War? Was it about that was, over? Or that was, the, the Korean War was pretty much over by then. You know, there were, um, there were still people shooting at each other over across the border. That was not a friendly place for, for U.S. troops to be stationed. But active combat had ceased. That was that, that long time. hiatus before Pan Wen John. That's right. Okay. Right. 56, and you uh, told me a moment ago, you, I think you entered the uh, military in 62. That's correct. Um, why did you join the military? Was there a draft on? Uh, there was, were you drafted? We was, there was a universal conscription at that mm -hmm. time. And um, I knew that if I didn't um, find myself a PhD program, I was going to be drafted. So I decided to, to enlist in the, in the reserve program. Rather than go away for two years, I decided that six months of active duty and five and a half years, or yes, yes five and a half years of um, active reserve duty was preferable to being uh, shipped out for two years. Consider, considering your social activism at the time, why did you go into the military other than some other way of uh, either expressing your feelings in or through the government? I never felt that um, I never felt anti-militaristic in terms of uh, social activism. Uh, I saw social activism as a part and parcel of the development of the country. I also saw the military as necessary to the preservation of the of the country. 
So there was, there was no dichotomy in my mind. With your fellow classmates in school, did you discuss the military or your options at the time or where the United States was going post-Korea? Uh, we did. We did. Um, I think a good many of us had a great deal of respect for the fact that Eisenhower had managed to keep us out of a shooting war in Southeast Asia. And unfortunately, as, well, when Kennedy came into power, Kennedy saw himself as being, quote, soft on communism. And we were all aware that a stand was going to be taken somewhere. And um, there, were, there were members of, uh, uh, members of my, my friends, associates of mine, who were fearful that we might become embroiled in a land war in Southeast You're Asia. You're referring to Vietnam? Yeah. Were the French still in Vietnam oh. at this time? No. This was after Dien Bien Phu. Okay, that's considerably uh, after. That was considerably after. They Dien had been Phu, uh, right. routed from Vietnam. Yes, and um, some of us were fearful that uh, despite best efforts on the part of Eisenhower and his army chief of staff, we were going to be embroiled in Southeast Asia. There were some of us who were looking at, at that as, an, as a possible uh, option. Now with that in mind, is, is that why you entered the military? I still felt the, the need to serve. I still felt the need to serve. Um, a citizen army is a part of a, a citizen's oblig service in a citizen army is a part of a citizen's obligation, I feel. Tell us about joining the military, the United States Army, why you chose that particular branch. What did they offer you that others didn't They didn't uh, offer me anything. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> it was just the opportunity to, well, you came to with serve in. considerable c credentials. Um, my dad's younger brother had been in uh, radio communications in World War II. His baby brother was in the Marines in a point unit in World War II. My mother's baby sister married a man who served with Stillwell mm. in World War II. So I had some idea about what I was what I was going towards. Um, so, and I just felt that um, the Army offered me the, an, op, an option to serve at a base that was close to home, relatively speaking. And uh, in this case, it was Fort Dix, New Jersey, which was certainly close to New York. And from there, it was a matter of four or five hours, five hours, mm -hmm. six hours on a bus if I wanted to come home. Uh, there were people that I could visit in New York. There were people I could visit in Philadelphia. And Dix was just about equidistant in terms of bus rides from both New York and Philadelphia. When you joined um, the uh, Army, <coughs> did other people you knew, uh, schoolmates perhaps, join or did you go in all by yourself? I went in pretty much by myself. What I had done was I picked up my degree, came back home, looked around at the options that were available here, and said, hmm, this looks like it, and I'm not imbued with a great desire to jump into a PhD program at this juncture, so let me find myself a unit. And that's what I did. Okay. You went to uh you were sent where for basic training? Fort Dix, Fort New, Dix Jersey. New Jersey. Right. Tell us about going down there. Went down there on the train, as many others have, and uh, got off in got off the train, and we were greeted in a, in a reception company, which is certainly a misnomer. 
because <laughs> we spent <laughs> we spent the better part of five five days in total confusion. <laughs> every time there was every time the, somebody yelled, we all fell out, and there was more and more of us it seems that arrived, and as, of course we had to we had to wait while everyone fell out onto the reception company street and by the time three or four days had gone by there were some six or seven hundred of us and uh, some were some were not as imbued to, <laughs> to answer the call as others so um, there were there were times when we would wait for a half hour or so for everyone to fall out and that was you're a very snappy outfit. Right? Oh, yes. Am yes, I correct indeed. that you were 24 years old at that time? I was about that, yes. Okay. So you, you were, you <coughs> were no kid. You were educated, an educated man. Uh, can you tell us about some of your teammates? In... Um, at Fort Dix. At Fort Dix? Yeah. I fell into a... Well, let's put it this way. I'd spent four summers working on railroad section gangs and living in working men's hotels. So this, this wasn't a strange world to me whatsoever. Um, I wound up in a unit in which I think there were, out of 220 of us in the unit, there were 160 of us with some college uh, experience or other. Um, to my way of thinking, the man in the unit with the most common sense was an 18-year-old from East Boston who had directed his life at being an automobile mechanic. But boy, he knew how to lead men. He was squad leader and he was one of, our, one of the squad leaders in our company. I, ass I assume you had taken, or you were still taking, a series of tests and exams to see what the Army was going to do with you. Well, we, we had pretty much decided that they were going to send me either to field communication school or to artillery spotter school out at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. And um, as luck would have it, I wound up going to field communications crewman school at Fort Dix after basic. And was, was your schooling there or did they send you to some other place to get No, the schooling, the schooling was right there at Tell Dix. us what, what you learned there and what you did there. Uh, basically we learned to lay and, re and retrieve uh, field wire in strategic and tactical situations. We also learned to troubleshoot. Uh, learned to set up and, and run a telephone net. Uh, they showed us a little bit, um, I, sp I think we spent a day or something like that, uh, working with an encryption device. At the same time, were you learning to uh, basically be a soldier? Did they march you around and give you a rifle? Oh, sure. They, um, well, this was basic training. We spent, uh, we spent eight weeks doing that. And uh, this was before we got to field communications crewman's course. Um, we had spent eight weeks uh, learning to use a weapon and qualifying with that. And learning how to drill uh, in proper military fashion. Did you like uh, boot camp at all, or basic training, or? Let's put it this did way. Did you dislike it? I didn't actively dislike it. I didn't actively like it. It was um, it was a period of my life, and it was. I think, I think in retrospect, it was a worthwhile period of my life. If at your age now you can look back and think that uh, an eighteen-year-old from Boston was one of the sharper guys in the outfit. What, a, what kind of commentary is that upon the uh, Well, yeah, the I, say that, I say that he had more leadership skills. There are, there are people who naturally have leadership skills. And this young man 
had them in full measure. Uh, 18 years of age, he had no college experience per mm -hmm. se, but he certainly had leadership ability. They made him a squad leader, you said? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yes, they did. Um, there were other there were other people in the unit who had uh, who had had educational experiences and who also had leadership ability. But this young man seemed to stand well. He, I guess he stood out because he and his assistant squad leader were both high school graduates, and that was it. His assistant squad leader came from Potato Country in northern Maine. And he was about 6'3 or 6'4, and we called him the Jolly Green Giant because he always had this gr infectious grin on his face. <laughs> and he talks funny. <laughs> not, so, not so much that he talked funny, but he was just, you know, we all knew that he came from a, from a, a farm background, and uh, he was the Jolly Green Giant. <laughs> yeah, that's a good name. Did you develop any close relationships during this period, guys that uh, might be with you for the rest of your time? Um, there was, there was a, re a relationship that developed that. I developed a relationship with one fellow from New York who had a master's degree in education, and he was looking to go on to a career in educational administration. There was another relationship that developed sort of unbeknownst to me and resulted in my acquiring employment in New York City when I got out of the service. Sort of this one fellow who had admired me and admired my background and um, said to me when we, were, when we were cashiering out, what do you think you're going to do? I said, well, I think I'll go into New York and I'll interview with the uh, New Jersey New York Board of Authority. He said, he said, you know what? He said, why don't you come with me? My dad is setting up a new agency. He's acting as a liaison between Albany and this new agency. Why don't you come with me and interview with them? So I did. And uh, That was fortuitous. Yes, it yes, was. Yes. yes, it was. Did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond what you've just described? No. No. So within a couple of months, uh, within a couple of months, I received I received the basic training. Then for two months thereafter, I went to field communications crewman's course, and um, we were taught, um, as I say, how to how to lay and retrieve wire under tactical situations. Took us out to the pole orchard, taught us how to climb telephone poles without killing ourselves you evidently which was a which was a neat which was a neat trick yeah. uh, because uh, it was by the time we got into the pole orchard it was October and there was hoarfrost on the poles and sometimes you'd gaff into something on the way down and it just wasn't there uh, and um, one of the critical skills that we learned was falling how to fall and Grace not get fall. hurt, yeah. right? So you re rediscovered the laws of gravity. Well, mm, you yeah. certainly discovered the laws of gravity, but le I managed to uh, to keep them from hurting hurting ourselves too badly. You've described what you have learned. Uh, would you rather have done something else in the military, or was that a good fit for you? Hmm. Really difficult to say, really difficult to say what was a good fit for me. It's not so much the object of any military organization to fit me or to, to fit itself to me. It is rather the object of that organization to fit me into a particular slot where they have mm -hmm. a need. They had a need for a field communications crewman. In the, in the reserve program, so that's where they fit me. At this point in your training, um, did the military ever sit you down and prepare you for any of the cultural differences you might face if you were sent overseas? No, because I wasn't, in a, I wasn't on, an act, on a combat track or an active duty track beyond the reserve program. Uh, there were people 
there were people we trained with who were going to be sent off into combat situations, or let's not say combat situations. They were going to be sent off to uh, bases around the world. And I really don't know what sort of a, a preparation they got. And I can't speculate. Okay, um, so that what you've described now as your experience, would you say this is pretty typical of a man who was going to serve actively for six months and then go into the reserves for f five and a half years, you said? I would say. I would say it was pretty typical. So this is what would happen to a guy under those circumstances. Right, right. Okay, then what happened to you after that? After that, I went to, a, <coughs> excuse me, I went to work in New York. And I was looking for a unit to join. Because, of course, we were told when we left, you, you got six months to find yourselves a unit, or we'll find one for you. Well, that always sounds pretty ominous. So um, I found a unit. The unit I found was the 77th Infantry Division in New York City. Um, the officers in the unit were, by and large, members of the police and fire departments of New York City. And we um, enlistees, so to speak, uh, PFCs, so on. Was that your rank at this time? At that you time, came out I, of private I first came out. Class. No, I came out a um, a private, and I got my stripe in uh, in the 77th Infantry Division, as I recall, first one. And um, a good many of the um, reservists. In the, in the enlisted reservists in the outfit were members of, at least in the admin company, let me put it that way, were members of, um, uh, were studying for, the, for their, um, their bar examination, or not studying for their bar examinations, they were waiting for the results of their bar examinations, and they were clerking with some of the, the New York City's larger legal firms and accounting houses. And that was as it, uh, I fell into an admin company. And that's where a great many of my cohorts were employed, either in the legal professions or in the in, um, accounting professions. You're joining the 77th Infantry Division. Was that contingent? upon their need for somebody with communication skills? Or did no, you it was, nothing? I was looking for, a, I went looking for a unit that had an open slot, basically. And I kept getting, well, we're all full up, why don't you try this one? And after about the fifth phone call, I had a chief warrant officer at the 77th Infantry Division who said to me, can you type? And I said, haltingly, he said, how halt are we talking about? <laughs> he said, 30 words a minute, something like that. He said, fine. He said, you, you've just become a clerk typist. I said, what about, he said, you've just become a clerk typist <laughs> in our admin section. And that's what I did with them. Was that the end of your use of your communication skills? Uh, pretty much so, pretty much so. Okay, you are in New York City, and you are a member of this 77th Infantry D Division. How long did you stay with them? I stayed with them for more than three years. I went to three summer camps with them. Um, summer camps, um, I was uh, I was in charge of cutting orders for for early releases or special releases, special release orders. As you, as you well know, a dead body has to travel under orders. And it was my job to cut those orders. Um, if someone got a call from home, there was an emergency situation. Of course, there would be a telex from the, um, from the Red Cross. And then on the basis of that telex, I could cut orders releasing this individual to go back to 
home to deal with it of whatever emergency was necessary to be dealt with. But that was my my job at, at summer camp, Camp Drum, New York. You did this for three years yep. up at Camp yeah, Drum, camp New, York. New York. Yeah. Um, not to demean what you've just described, but is that all you did? Did you pick up any, any uh, did you reinforce your infantry skills? Mm, not really. We didn't get it, for example, we didn't get a chance to fire very often. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, I don't think I fired more than a dozen rounds in those three summers. That's, you know, that's, that's a basic military skill right there. Um, so I felt, did you hit I, I felt the lack. <laughs> with each of those four bullets? Did, did you? Oh, yeah. I, managed, I managed to hit something that was, that was cheap. <laughs> yeah. How long were you at Camp Drum? Did you go up for two weeks? We would go up for two weeks. Two yeah. weeks. And we always drew the last tour of the summer. And the last tour of the summer up there can be very, very cold. And we had, uh, we had a disastrous time the last summer we were up there because of the cold. Can you tell us about that? Uh, we lost, <coughs> excuse me, we lost an enlisted man with walking pneumonia. We lost uh, a major to heart attack. And we're talking really brutally cold conditions. The first night we got up there, we had left New York City, it was 85 degrees, 88 degrees. It was really hot. And the air conditioning units were on in the buses full blast. By the time we got to Schenectady, people were screaming at the drivers, asking them to turn off the air conditioning, and people were, were diving into their duffel bags looking for the field, not only the field jackets, but the liners that went in them. And we got up to camp, and they issued us two blankets. And I was in, a, I was indoors. I was in an indoor unit, and I rolled myself up on the, in the two blankets on a, on a box spring, and there was just no way that I could keep warm all night long. No matter how I wrapped those blankets around me, there was just no way that I could stay warm that night. And I jumped out of the, the sack first thing in the morning, and I looked at the butt can hanging on the on the post next to my bunk. And there was ice in that butt can at 5.30 in the morning. So I knew I was going to have a problem as soon as I got over to my office. Sure enough, I did. We had a case of walking pneumonia who got on the bus from New York City, tried to see the division medical officer, and was waved onto the bus. He was dead that morning. And the next morning, I had dead major. And the uh, morning after that, I had two cap happy campers who decided to pitch their tent in a, in a tank track. And they never got up in the morning. It sounds to me like um, today, I suspect, this would be the cause of newspaper headlines. It's, you know, all bureaucracies are inefficient. And military bureaucracies are no different than any other. They are inefficient. And unfortunately, people die because of these inefficiencies. How long before the heat came on? Well, we had no heat. Never we in two no weeks heat. you went no, through this? We had no heat. We had no heat. Luckily, the weather warmed up a little bit. We got to the point where we, uh, we didn't have to worry about frost at night. And ice at night. But the first four or five days were brutally cold and we weren't prepared for it. So you did get out of there eventually? No, oh, yeah. We came and back. This is. Uh, we came back to. Uh, I joined an outfit in Philadelphia to finish up in 68. And um, they were an infantry brigade. And 
they made me a field communications crewman once again and an assistant squad leader. Wow. And I was, I was training some, some of their hopefuls in the, in the art and science of not so much climbing, but in laying and retrieving and troubleshooting on field com communications. Did, did the technology change at all during the time you were in the no. service? No, you started out laying wires and you, you ended up and laying Ended up wires. doing so. When I got overseas, when I got into the Israeli Air Force, I was using, um, we were using a radio net in a, in a Jeep. Of course, that technology hasn't changed. Field radios are great. You can beat the daylights out of those things and they still come back for more. It's an incredible piece of equipment. In 68, was that the end of your obligation to the military? That's correct. United That's States correct. military? That's now, correct. Now you've just taken a transition here. You're in the Israeli army. Well, I went to, I'm, I went to live in Israel in 1977 and lived there for more than 10 years. Uh, would you tell us, well, let's finish with the U.S. Okay. Army. Was that it? Um, you were honorably discharged? I was you honorably had, discharged. I had yeah. the rank of Spec 5 E5. And um, that was pretty much my career. Met some interesting people, particularly in New York. Um, there was a man who was going out of the unit as I was coming into it. And I was introduced to him. He's Gay Talisi, the author. The man who worked, worked for the New York Times. Yes, he did. Yeah. And he was, he, was, he was then writing a, a series for the New York Times Sunday Magazine on the Mafia. And he had penetrated the, the Banana family. And he was writing about that. As a matter of fact, he wrote a book about his, uh, these experiences called uh, Honor Thy Father. And he wrote several others, which, yes. which were very, yeah. very well received, as yes. I recall. He was, an he was an excellent journalist. Gay is an excellent journalist. And um, the individual who introduced, who introduced us was a young sports writer for the Times at that time. His name is Robert Lipsight. And Bob's gone on to have quite a career and a reputation in the, how, in the world of sports journalism. How did you meet these people? Just by chance. Just by chance? Just by chance. New York and Philadelphia, you didn't come back up into Boston during this time? No. I was working and I worked uh, for a few years in New York and then I, tra uh, I moved to Philadelphia and began working for the Delaware Valley Reg Regional Planning Commission. That was in 1965, I believe. So you were putting your college specialty to use now? Yes, I was, okay. in regional transportation planning so program. So nine years goes by, if I'm tracking you correctly. That's correct. Um, you're in Israel. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Israel was a place I had always dreamed of going. A small child, I grew up as a uh, thinking and dreaming about being a Jewish soldier in a Jewish country. And um, I got the opportunity to, to go and live and work in Israel in 1977. And I made Aliyah. And uh, we went. I then had a, a wife, a four and a half year old son. Um, it was a great place for him to grow up. It's a it's a paradise for for young children because the the whole society bends over backwards to do everything and give everything to uh, to its children. Of course, the the unfortunate part is that by the time when they hit 18, then they pay their dues. They go into the Israeli army. And, so, and for some of them, it's quite a shock. And you served in, in the army. Did you, did you have dual citizenship? Yes. What, what does that in, entail? Once upon a time, the United States frowned upon such things. It no longer does. In certain, in certain cases. The British Commonwealth of Nations has never frowned on such cases. Um, it has always been the case where if you held citizenship 
in one country in the British Commonwealth, you could get a British passport like that and go anywhere. Um, being a member of a, being a citizen of one of the forder, former British Commonwealth countries entitles you into uh, to entree into virtually any of them. Um, so the British experience has long recognized dual citizenship, so to speak. The United States is beginning to recognize, has begun to recognize dual citizenship, and especially in the case of Israel. Um, and Ireland. And Ireland, that's right. That's right. And there, is this something? Uh, this is something what, what that has happened. What caused you to do this? Did you have to do this, or you wanted to do this? This is something that I wanted to do. There was a job opportunity, and it no, was. No, I meant the citizenship. Oh, the citizenship. Yeah. Let's put it this way: If you serve in the military, you're a citizen. So, and which came first, serving in the military or becoming the citizen? I think becoming the citizen came first, if I remember correctly, but the two were very, very close. Did, in did you and your wife sit down one night and say, uh, you're going to become a, 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 an Israeli citizen? My wife was already an Israeli citizen. Okay. It was already a dual national. Uh, she went over there with her family to live on a settlement, and they were there for more than a year. And then they came back when her grandfather died. This was in the early 50s, so she was, she, was already, she was already a dual citizen. What sort of work enticed you to come over there? What, what was the nature of your job? Well, I was offered a position with a regional transportation planning agency. And when I got over there, I said, let's talk about the work. And they said, oh, you'll have, you'll have two and a half thousand dollars a month, and I thought, Good Lord, Israeli salaries, salaries have gone through the roof. What's, what are they talking about? They said, oh yeah, the job is in Quito, Ecuador. I said, you mean to tell me that I picked up and moved all of my belongings, which are not here yet, to have you tell me that volta face, I'm going back to, I'm going to Quito, Ecuador. It's a great place. I You'll said, love it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful place. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll do it on one condition. I said, you will join me and we will go to the rabbinate and I will ask for a get, a get as a, as a formal bill of divorce. Because I said, if I go home and tell my wife that I'm going off to Quito, Ecuador, and she's got to stay here and wait for the furniture, we're finished. <laughs> And they said, no, we don't think we're quite going to do that. So I found a job working in the, in the Ministry of Transportation in Tel Aviv, in their urban transportation unit. And I worked as a planner there for, planner economist there for, what, 15 months. And then they needed to give the slot to somebody else. And I happened uh, to find a, a slot with uh, the National Transportation Carrier, the National Bus uh, Cooperative, which is called EGIT. It's a huge bus company. Uh, they operate they operate 4,500 buses a day. That's a that's a pretty sizable operation. And I stayed with them for about 15 months. And then they had to give my slot to somebody else. Somebody's relative was coming back into the country and needed a slot, and mine was it. So then I went to, uh, I became a tech writer and editor through Manpower. And that's what I did for the rest of the time that I was in Israel. You went over there in 77, is that that's correct? That's correct. Uh, as a little bit of background, I looked up your dates here. Um, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat arrived in Israel on the first visit by an Arab leader to the Jewish state since it was founded in 1948. That's right. He arrived. In, he arrived. You and he arrived in the same year. Just yes, exactly. That was exactly it. We arrived just before the national election, 
and uh, that was that was the election that that Begin won. His yep. uh, Likud party won. And, and this was the first time that the Labour Party had ever been out of power since the state had been established. And not too long thereafter, Sadat made his historic visit to to Israel. I mean, I can remember sitting in the in the absorption center watching this on television. We were all stunned. And he and Begin. Uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize the following year. So you, right. you came in on a kind of pivotal year in the history of the state. Yes. Now tell us about your army service. I served with a, um, with a base security battalion. And within that battalion there was a SWAT team. I wound up as a member of the SWAT team, senior member of the SWAT team. And there were, there were two SWAT teams that were created in this base security battalion that was attached to the Air Force, Israeli Air Force Reserves. There was one group which was called Koach Rambo, which is the Rambo Force. They were all under the age of 35. And then there was our group, which was all uh, uh, over the age of 35. And we were called Koach Krembo. Krembo is like a it's an ersatz, sticky, sweet, gooey, <laughs> chocolatey mess. <laughs> Did you consider this a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> um, Who were you to SWAT? Basic, the, the basic idea, the basic premise was that uh, base headquarters or some other important element of the base has been attacked and held by enemies. Um, the SWAT team's responsibility was to relieve that uh, force or to, or to remove that force. So you're in a, a, a very serious shooting situation now, That's that is, right. if, right. if you're called upon to do this. That's right. And we, had, and we had some pretty intensive training. Uh, Ordinary Israeli training calls for 30 days a year. We were called for 45. We could have been called for more if there was a need. Tell us, at your age, uh, what it's like to sit down and start being trained to very seriously shoot at other human beings. It's very, very frightening. Not only was I trained to do so, I was sent to do so. Uh, I wound up wandering around in snow up to my hips in the Shuf Mountains in southern Lebanon. We were supposed to be a, um, a base security battalion, but that meant that we could be sent off the base to look for, for enemy troops when we weren't actively serving in that, in that role. And initially it seemed that that's what they need us, needed us to do, was to go out and scout out. And what we were supposed to do was to call for backup. Of course, we were all, uh, we were all as nervous as cats, to tell you the truth. Um, you're walking around in, uh, in olive groves in uh, in the mountains and in the snow in the middle of the night. And if you see something move, you're going to fire on it. You're not going to ask for any um, password or anything like that. You're, would, would you're not going to call for backup. You'll just turn and fire on that. Yeah. Would these be Lebanese or Syrians that, uh, that they were, were These were PLO. These were PLO. At and we got, into, we yeah. got into some serious firefights with them. Can you tell us what kind of equipment you used? We were using um, M16s. M16s and we were also... United States equipment. Yes, United States equipment. We were also, some of us, using Israeli equipment. There's a, gal uh, there's a weapon called the Galani, which is a, a sort of a combination of the, um, the M16 and the Kalachnikov. The United States sends uh, 
five billion dollars a year over to Israel uh, for defensive purposes That's or right. military purposes. Can you tell us, um, did you see how this is being used and what effect it has on the Israeli military? Some of it is, is well used, some of it was, you know, there was um, the Levy project blew up, literally, while I was there. And um, this was an Israeli wild dream. They were going to build a, a fighter aircraft. Well, how were they going to go about doing this? Well, they were going to use all U.S. components. And then they were going to sell this on the world market. Something's wrong with this. Something is dreadfully wrong with this. Plus the fact that uh, they couldn't cost it because there weren't enough people in the Ministry of Defense whose specialty it was to cost such things. There were only five economists in the Ministry of Defense to handle all of the, the, the defense projects that were going on. That's impossible. That's impossible. They should have had at least ten times that number. And the Levy went down for a number of reasons, and one of the reasons was because nobody could tell what it was going to cost, what it was really going to cost, until uh, Cap Weinberger set a very, very bright uh, economist who happened to be an Orthodox Jew to the task of preparing cost estimates of what this thing was going to cost. And it became apparent very readily that this was going to, um, this was going to endanger all of Israel's defense effort because it was going to suck up every dollar and every dime for years to come. Well, Israel has other other defense needs. It needed submarines, for example, which you wouldn't have been able to purchase. It needed, it needed aircraft. It needed to, to upgrade its Merkava tank. These things would not have been possible had the Levy gone forward. Was it killed? Uh it was eventually by a joint killed. agreement yeah. with the yeah. United States. Eventually, it was killed Wine by a joint agreement people. by um, Rabin was the end was the individual who finally put the put the lid on the project. We interrupted you a moment ago when you were hip deep in snow, <laughs> walking around in Lebanon. What was the reason for your having been sent to Lebanon in the first place? This was 1981. This was the the Lebanese incursion. The Israelis. The Israelis took a political gamble and they lost. They had a man all set and ready to put at the, at the head of the Lebanese government, Bashir Jamail, and he was assassinated. Sort of a joint effort by the Syrians and members of his own family, perhaps. So you were, you and your team. We were, you got a we were, call we were got a, we got a, a, well, the whole country went to war, basically. There was a barrage of, first of all, there was a barrage of, of, um, of rockets into northern settlements. And these were fired by, from, by PLO into northern Israel. And at about this time, the Israeli ambassador in London had a bullet put in his brain without the benefit of clergy, so to speak. And that was the, that was the incident that kicked off the, the war. How, how did you and your team get up into Lebanon? By bus. By bus? Yeah. Got up to, got up to the border by bus and then we transferred over to a deuce and a half. Your camp drum <laughs> experience paid off, if you look at it that, that way. <laughs> yeah. By that time, by that time, I had learned to fire a, a number of weapons. 
I'm going to get back to Lebanon in a minute. Okay. But I'd like you to, we have a rare opportunity with your being here with us tonight. I'd like you to compare your training in the United States Army and the training you received from the Israelis. It's very, very interesting. The, quote, basic training I got from the Israelis was very limited in terms of going to a, going to a range and firing. That part of it was very limited. We, did, we pulled a lot of off-base guard duty during our basic training. But when I got with, with the, the security battalion, that's where I began to get real training real training because we would go um, I think it was was it every once a year yeah once a year we had a training exercise and this was a live fire training exercise and it might last three days it might last uh, we had one when they put together the team They had the team work together in various live fire scenarios for a week. And then they brought us to, a, 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 to our base for a joint exercise with, uh, the, um, with the tank corps and with the Air Force. So they, they were not cheap about expending ammunition. No. As no, but the they were Army they were in the you. they were in the in the basic in the so-called basic training exercises. But once we got into once I got into the unit, and they started to form the 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 team, then there was no problem about using using weaponry, using ammunition of various types. Okay, essentially, were you a sniper? As, as a member of this SWAT team? No. It was what is the connotation then? Of the my, there, were, there, was a, there was a group of snipers. Our job was to go in, no, our job was to go in and relieve the, the, ca the captives, basically. We weren't as to stand. As an heavy kind of? That's right. All right. That's right, yeah. So it was a more active role. And the snipers were much more specific as to targets. That's right. Okay. That's right. Now back again to the question of the, the training that you received in the respective armies. Did you have a, I, I don't want to feed you uh, my feelings, but it seems to me the Israelis were much more serious about what they were doing. Had to be. The enemy's just over the border. If you could imagine a situation here where you had, say, four or five times the population of the United States residing in Central America, and another four or five times that population residing in Canada, and both of these populations really, really hostile to the citizens of the United States, you begin to approach the situation that exists in Israel. It's just over the border. And you've got a nation state there that's about the size of New Jersey. So how far are you from the border? What does this do to you, your psyche, or, or psychologically? You wake up in the morning, I and you know these guys are, there are out there? there are, Let's put it this way, there are, there are things that you notice and things that you don't notice. The first thing I had to do when I got there was to train my four and a half year old son not to tra touch strange objects. They might be plastic explosives. That's a little unsettling. To train him that if he saw something strange on the street, he was to call a police officer call an adult to call a police officer and to get away from that. If he saw something strange in a, in a bus shelter, 
he was to warn people that there was something strange there. This is the year 2001, right? And this was happening back in '77. That's, it's still happening now. Yeah, it's still happening now. What about your wife? Uh, you take off and you're hip deep in snow in Lebanon. Uh, As she was, she was, was she back part of the armed forces at all? No, she was. Um, she taught. She taught dance. She's a dancer choreographer. Are not women uh, integrated into the armed forces on a equal basis? There? Yes, they are. But once they hit the age of, once they get married then they have to actively choose to be in the armed forces. And once they get past the, the age of, shall we say, mid-twenties, late-thirties, they'd have to be in, well, actually, my ex was in tremendous physical condition, but uh, she didn't want any part of, of the military. When women are Part of the military. Oh, they there. certainly are. What very, kind very of jobs are, are they selected? All do of they the, go in combat? Yes, they do. Um, there for a while, um, uh, there was there was an attempt to take them out of direct combat because Islamics wouldn't surrender to a woman, and then people began to feel, oh, this is a little ridiculous. Um, Regardless of, it, of whether it's a support um, position or an active combat position, this young lady's life is going to be in danger. She might as well be armed and know how to use the doggone thing and have that skill as well as the skill that we need her to perform. For example, all of the people who arm bombs are women. They have far greater manual dexterity than you and I do as males of the species. The women who, uh, the mechanics who work on combat aircraft are women. Their hands are smaller, they're more agile, they can get into tighter, tighter tolerance spaces on a combat aircraft than a man can. Electronics techs are likely to be male, but mechanics? are likely to be women. And the armorers are all women. All women. Just as an example. Let's get back to the business of the Israeli psyche a minute. One of the big monuments outside of uh, Jerusalem is that convoy that was shot up. That's right. It sits there rusting on the side of the road. Yeah. They left it there. Uh, this is a very deliberate Act on a part of the government to remind you. That's right. Uh, of the remind remind people of the sacrifices that were made. Yeah. There's a new road now. You can bypass that altogether on the new road. But if you go up the the old road, you'll see these you'll see these pieces of, and they're they're not all together. They're strewn over a period a space of some kilometers. May I ask you a personal question? Um, what about your four and a half year old son growing up in this and you teach him to be aware of not just strangers but anything that's out of the ordinary? What effect does that have on children? Um, it's mixed because on the one hand society says to them you've got to watch out for this that and the other thing but on the other hand society says here is music, here is art, here are all kinds of activities uh, which we support you in. Here is almost a fairyland for you to grow up in, where anything, anything you want within reason is yours until you get to be 18 years of age, and then you pay your dues. But what about teaching a child to trust? How, how can that children fit trust in? children trust each other? You know they grow up in the um, the building block of Israeli society is the kfutza, the group, 
And this is a group of kids who've been together since since they were in kindergarten, some of them. And they will track together through grammar school, through high school, through the military, and they'll play cards together after they get out of school, and they meet together for weddings and, and other happy occasions and some unhappy occasions, but they'll track with each other for the, for the better part of their lives. Let's put a real magic hat on your head tonight. Uh, knowing what's happening in Israel these days, what happened yesterday at the bus stop, right. a doctor blown to pieces. Um, do you see an end to this? And I, I agree with Sharon. You do. It isn't going to be. A, we're not going to have a comprehensive peace process overnight. This. This thing, whatever it is, is going to have to happen incrementally because the two parties are going to have to learn to trust one another, and that's going to take a long time. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's not something that's going to happen with a handshake. The, in the waning moments of the Clinton administration, it seemed we were so close. We were so close to getting the Israelis to give up everything. And the Palestinians, thank God, have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And they missed a golden one. Uh, that opportunity won't be on the table, or anything like it, for as long as Sharon is in power. And the Israelis want him in power because they're afraid. Barack seems to me to have you, you're saying he gave, he gave away, away the story. He gave away. He gave away. He gave away far too much. Far too much. Or he wanted to give away far too much. Okay. One last time. Let's go back to Lebanon. All right. <laughs> Deep snow. All right. What did you do up there? Did you shoot at people and get in firefights? And uh, uh, we in, did. In her, we, how large a group were you? Platoon size. I was a, we went out as squads, and I was a squad, um, an assistant squad leader. And um, we were supposed to call for backup. If we saw something, we were supposed to call for backup, and we were supposed to make sure that whatever it was that we were engaging, or we hoped to engage, was in fact inimical to us. Well, for goodness sakes, you're walking around hip deep in snow in these olive groves in the wee small hours of the morning. And if you see something moving on that snow that doesn't look like a branch, you're going to fire on it. <laughs> Particularly in my own instance, in my own case, here I was, perhaps twice the age of individuals that I was being sent to, to combat against. And I was afraid that their faster reflexes were going to do me in, pure and simple. How did so you I was more imbued to fire first yeah. than anything else. And a good many of us were also. How, how were you sure it wasn't your own squad? Oh, we, we knew where, where our squads were. Our squads were on one side of the road or the other, and we were looking off into the, into, the, into the orchards as we made our way along. Did you say before that you had tank support or uh, any aircraft support? And that was, no, that was in a, in a, base, in a joint base exercise. Okay. Here we could, have, we could have called for backup on a radio but it would have been some time coming. Um, what kind of help also, would have arrived? Hmm? What, would, would you have brought in airplanes or what? No, there would have been some, um, some heavy weapon support, uh, heavier than what we were carrying. We were carrying uh, BAR was the heaviest thing we had. That's the Browning it. automatic rifle. That's right. They're still using these. Oh, yes, They're they are. They're a good weapon, yeah. Best it's 
It's one of the best products General Motors ever made. Tires never go flat. As we <laughs> That's right. That's a good old Saginaw switch and gear division. Now, um, we're, we're going to assume that you safely got out of Lebanon. How were you finally extracted the mission we were, over or we something? Were, we were choppered out because we were such a disaster. We got into something like eight or nine firefights in four nights. And we just couldn't stay out of trouble. And finally, three of us got wounded. Including yourself? Yeah. yeah. Luckily, the, uh, the round that, uh, that hit us was a real dud. Um, so it didn't, it didn't come up as high, anywhere near as high as it should have. And I got a few, a few pieces of shrapnel in my right knee. But it uh, really makes you feel stupid because you get down saying to yourself, oh, it's all my fault if we hadn't been bunched up so closely together. And then you're saying to yourself, this is, afterwards, you say to yourself, this is a military exercise. Um, you did something very foolish to begin with, not calling for backup. That was, that was mistake number one. And you managed to live through that mistake through seven or eight previous occurrences. Well, the law of averages was bound to catch up with you, stupid. Here you are. <laughs> I have a question for you that I, that I don't even know how to frame, but let's go ahead. Let's give it a go. What were you fighting for? Fighting for the right of people to live in a country without being fired upon by their neighbors. That's what I was fighting for. I certainly wasn't fighting for the for the. Uh, um, political gamble that was taking place. Um, but I was, I was fighting for the right of people who lived in the northern tier of settlements not to be fired upon. What is the, um, how are these settlements doing these days? Where are they in relation they're still to being, the, they're the still being fired. shifted since you were there, I right. take it? Um, there was a there was a response to some shelling not too long ago where the Israelis took out a Syrian radar emplacement which got people very very upset oh this well, is this, the air flight up into the Lebanon right. car that's right and uh, um, of course when Sharon first when this whole exercise in Lebanon first blew up Sharon really wanted to take on the Syrians once and for all. And uh, he was stopped from doing that. But that was his, that was his principal objective in, in Lebanon, was the Syrian armed forces. He wanted them out because they're, uh, they're quite a destabilizing force in the area. The United States Secretary of State within the last month has talked uh, with Hassad uh, with going to sun. Syria. Right. Yeah. Um, what could the United States broker to alleviate, with, to get rid of the Syrians in, the, in this puzzle? I don't know that the, that the United States has any currency in this, in this affair. The major currency in, the, in this affair is water. The Israelis hold the water, the Syrians want it. And the Syrians are going to have to give up something in order to get the water. That's the, that's the game. Um, and the Syrians want to, want to posture like crazy, but it isn't going to get them potable water. And that's what they need, desperately. That's interesting. It should come to that. I mean, water is water is more valuable in that part of the world than oil or gold or diamonds. Sounds like the southwest of the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis mm -hmm. Mexico. Yeah. Very Are you true. still a member of the uh, armed forces? No. In, in Israel, I'm, you're you're out of the army. I'm out. I'm Tell out. us about getting out. And you served two years, <laughs> did you? In in Israel? Yes. I served more than ten. More, excuse me, more than 10. Yeah, the reserves, yeah. And, and it was, uh, 
I had a tough time getting out. They didn't want to let me go. And I finally had to turn to a distant relative of mine and say, hey, what's going on here? And all of a sudden, doors that were closed to me opened immediately. May and I, I, was, you, I was at an age then where it was quite logical for me to ask to get out. I was 50. I was almost 50. What, what skills did you possess that made them uh, so reluctant to let you go? They didn't need the skills. They needed a warm body. Of course, this was, um, this was at the beginning of the time when people began flooding in from Eastern Europe. But they couldn't foresee that then. This was 19, 1989, 1990, thereabouts. And all of a sudden, the, the gates opened up in Eastern Europe. Tremendous numbers of people came out. This is Romanians, uh, Romanians, Bulgarians Russians, Bulgarians. Russians. Not so much the Bulgarians, the Bulgarians. Bulgarians have always treated their Jewish population like citizens which is very unusual in that part of the world. Um, but they came from Romania, they came from Hungary, they came from, um, from all poor parts of the, so of the former Soviet Union. So they got a lot of warm bodies. Yes, they did. And you got out of the army, and did, did your coming home uh, was that at the same time, or did you decide to yeah, come I came back. Yeah. I came back into the United States. Um, my parents aren't getting any younger, and I just felt that somebody should be here to kind of look in on them every now and again. May I, okay, so you're out of the Army. Uh, did, did anyone in the United States of an official capacity ever sit down and talk with you about your experiences in the Israeli army? No. Has is, is anybody from the United States Army ever talked to you? No. Do you got a book in back of you somewhere that you're, <laughs> you've got a lot to talk about? Um, I'm too busy doing what I do to think about writing a book. I'm a, a I'm the transportation coordinator for the town of Framingham, and I uh, oversee the operation of the lift bus, and that gives me quite enough to do. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. <laughs> We're just about uh, through my list of questions here. Uh, is there any one thought or incident that I haven't covered here or thought to ask um, that you'd like to tell us about tonight? in either army or either country? There are, there are many incidents, for example, that weren't covered in, in this country's press because it would have injured the sensibilities of those watching or listening, which is rather strange. This is a press here in this country which could flash the the shot on television of that poor man getting his brains blown out by an interrogator in Vietnam night after night after night at supper time to drive home the message of how anti-war the media was and how anti-war everyone, the Vietnam War everyone in this country should be. But presenting similar incidents in the Middle East they have no interest. For example, the glorious leader of Syria was regaled by the sight of some of his female soldiers eating live snakes to strengthen them in their resolve against the Zionist oppressors. This was on Syrian TV. Never made it into any of this, this country's media outlets. I'm sure this was back in I was on a live fire exercise in 70, what? No, it was 81 or 82. 
But there's a constant string of these things, which are never picked up by the by this press, because um, that would serve to demonize. And there's some justification for that. There's some justification for that. One doesn't want to demonize. But what the Israelis face is not something that they're going to get be overcome with a handshake. And it's going to have to be overcome over a period of years in building trust. And that takes time. I, I don't want to paraphrase what you've just said, but is your suggestion that the press in the United States isn't covering this because the subject is is unpleasant, or it's just the, the press is is just being lazy. Um, I don't think the press is being essentially lazy. They're distracted by baseball <coughs> games or something. I don't think it's essentially laziness. Um, there are there's a lot of oil at stake, and the the supporters of the have not of the disruptive factions in the have-not states are the oil states, by and large. Iraq, Iran. This is where um, a great many of the Hezbollah factions get their money. And of course, it all gets funneled through the leader of the PLO. There isn't a thing that happens that he doesn't first approve. And then he allows some money for it. The rest of it, nobody knows where that money goes. How old a man is Yasser Arafat? Arafat's got to be, what, is he early, mid-60s, something of that nature. Is there an heir apparent that you know of? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. So as long as... He controls the um, the major portion of the PLO, the Fatah um, element, and they constitute oh two thirds to three quarters of the membership of the uh, the PLO the directorate. Now every other splinter group has a seat at the table but they're not allowed to do anything without first okaying it with Yasser Arafat. And he then provides money for them to do whatever it is they're doing. I thank you for being with us tonight. It's You're entirely very, welcome. Very educational for me, I'll tell Good. you. <laughs> I appreciate your being here. Thank you. Good to be here.